So coming up, we have the uh, city and county patchwork panel, um, an incredible array of panelists up here. Um, and let's give it up for the first women on panels. Yes. We made it. Um, all right, so this is the city and uh, county patchwork. Uh, as was said on the uh, online little summary, the state has figured it out, sort of. We just need the local governments to do their jobs. Um, so I'll do a quick intro. I'll let uh, all of the panelists kind of intro themselves a little bit more. Um, I do have one question after you do your intro, just to let the people kind of know what you do on the day-to-day. Um, and actually, my name is Issa Perez. I work at, at Meadow. Uh, we're a point of sale company. Um, so we build software for dispensaries and delivery services. So uh, we work with California retailers across the state. So local government, local regulation is very, very near and dear to my heart and brain and soul. And uh, I'm here today also representing Supernova Women, an organization um, that is, yeah. It's empowering women of color in the industry and also advocating for social justice and equity uh, in cannabis. So our first uh, panelist, we have Ariana Van Alstein, um, and she is an attorney uh, with a lot of expertise uh, with the regulations. And Ariana, just give people a little brief summary of what you do day to day to do this patchwork on the local level. Thank you. Yeah, you got to hold it right there, and there we go. Is That's it, perfect. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so day to day, I do licensing and compliance for cannabis businesses all over the state of California. Uh, mostly working on uh, local licenses and preparation for state licenses, and then navigating through the regulations as they change day to day and week to week. Awesome. Thank you, Ariana. Uh, next, we have. Uh, Jackie McGowan, you've probably heard her already, uh, giving some of the uh, Q&A portions of the other panels. Um, she is Director of Licensing and Business Development at K Street Consulting. Um, and Jackie, tell us a little bit about how you do patchwork day to day. So, hi, my name is Jackie McGowan. I work for K Street Consulting. I'm a local licensing consultant, uh, but my background is I am a former Wall Street stockbroker. And when I got into this space, I realized that there wasn't a centralized location for uh, anyone to go to to get late breaking news um, of everything that was going on throughout the state. So um, I decided to uh, use my Wall Street background and create my own news feed. And I set up 540 Google email alerts, one for every city in the county, one for every city and county in the state. And then I decided to dump all of that data into a Facebook group that I first named California City and County Ban Watch, because at the time, uh, this was early 2016, when uh, we dubbed Banapalooza uh, as uh, what was going on in the industry at the time. I've since changed the name to City and County Regulation Watch. Um, and uh, we have 7,000 members uh, that are all California residents. That was really important to me uh, to make sure that the conversation uh, being had was about people that were being affected by these problems um, so that we could come up with solutions together as California residents. And uh, we have about 14 moderators that uh, keep that page frequently uh, being updated with late breaking news on, we have probably about 1,300 uh, in individual posts that come through the group each uh, month. And uh, our moderators are making sure that everybody is being respectful in that content. And if you're not a member of the group, um, I highly encourage you to join. Um, and I, I, I do run that, but I also uh, work uh, at the local level in several jurisdictions and have helped uh, cannabis businesses get their local permits. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, definitely join the Facebook group, never a dull moment. Um, next we have a uh, really exciting mayor of West Hollywood, John Duran. Give him a round of applause. This is his fifth term, um, 18 years on the council now. So mayor, tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day patchwork over in West Hollywood. Greetings from the people of the city of West Hollywood, where the women are strong and the men are pretty. And we're very, very proud of that distinction. 
We have had cannabis on the Sunset Strip for about 100 years. 100 cannabis has been part of the Sunset Strip and the nightlife in the city of West Hollywood for a century. And so we're very proud and happy of introducing the first ordinance to actually get into the regulation of cannabis in our city. My mayorship, uh, as a local elected official, like most local electeds, it's a part-time gig. So I have a, a real job in the day. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. That's what I do in the daytime. And uh, my practice, I've been in practice for 30 years, has been representing a whole lot of lawbreakers. Yeah. First act up in Queer Nation when they were blocking government buildings to demand drugs and treatment for HIV and AIDS. Then I was the attorney for Clean Needles Now, which was the very first needle exchange in Southern California, giving clean needles to junkies who we were afraid were going to contract HIV, passing around dirty needles. And then I became legal counsel for the Los Angeles Cannabis Resource Center in the early 90s. It was the very first uh, medicinal marijuana uh, organized facility on the corner of Fountain and Fairfax in the city of West Hollywood. So I've been doing this a long time, first as a criminal defense lawyer and now as the man. So really happy to be here with all of you. Thank you, Mayor. And, and last but not least, we have Charles Harvey, uh, legislative representative for the League of Cities. Uh, it's only his third month in his position. So bravo to you being here, Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Issa. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow uh, Mayor Duran. That's <laughs> in any event. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Charles Harvey with the League of California Cities. Uh, I am the public safety lobbyist for, for the League. Uh, my capacity, my portfolio extends from not just cannabis, but also uh, working uh, issues relative to police use of force uh, to, uh, sorry, I, I apologize. I'm going on about three hours of sleep. I have a one month old and a 22 month old. And so I'm keeping very, very busy at home, but um, no, I'm very excited to be here. I, 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 told, uh, I told everyone on a, on a planning call um, earlier in the week or last week that, uh, you know, my, my goal here today uh, really is to sort of, you know, be, be a sponge and listen directly to, I guess, what concerns uh, everyone has, industry participants, um, uh, other folks, and, and really sort of, you know, develop my own sense of, of where uh, the League of California Cities can can sort of can help to um, help to solve problems, help to you know find find solutions that that work for everyone. And uh, as previous panelists have have talked about, uh, generally speaking, there isn't anything that necessarily comes easy on this issue. It's a very hot button issue. People get very very passionate. I understand that. Um, and so, again, uh, I I'm excited to be here today and looking forward to a robust discussion. Awesome, thank you, Charles. All right, so we'll kind of get right into it. Just before we get into more specific questions, um, this is about local government, this is about you know, city to city. What, what is local government? What does that mean to you? What do, wh who really holds the power in local government? So if you can talk a little bit about who actually has the control and where it comes from, those might be two different answers to the audience and maybe one you have in your head, feel free to share both. Um, but anyone can go first. I think it depends on the jurisdiction. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, on the ground in several different uh, areas where uh, the sheriff you know, is the one making the decisions and calling it his county. Um, I've been in the opposite situation where the sheriff has said, uh, I answer to the Board of Supervisors. Um, I've been in situations where it's clear that it's the city manager that is pulling the strings. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, really, you, it, you follow the money. Um, whoever is supporting the people that are making the decisions, that's really who's pulling the strings, in my opinion. I, I want to agree with that. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, I was a proponent of forming a West Hollywood Police Department on the ballot in 1991. We lost, but we lost 51% uh, to 49%. So we just lost. And uh, when that happened, the Los Angeles County Sheriff uh, called me in and said, what do we need to do to improve? It's a $14 million contract. 
And so we gave them a list. And one of the things on the list was that uh, the city of West Hollywood in 2003 declared marijuana enforcement to be the lowest level priority yeah. for the city of West Hollywood. And the sheriff said, well, you know, I'm going to publicly oppose you. I said, I don't care what you do publicly. I just don't want you arresting people for smoking a joint on the Sunset Strip. So can we work together here? You say whatever you need to say for your election, but we're not going to, we don't want any of the 14 million going into marijuana enforcement. You want to enforce drug laws? Go after crystal meth. That is a nasty drug that destroys people in their lives, but leave marijuana alone. And that's been the state of affairs since then. But I, I agree, the city manager, he is the CEO of our city. Most small cities have a city manager who runs the government, but it's the power of three. It's like you know the three sisters on the TV show Charmed. You got the power of three, you, you, you can do anything. And so I'm always trying to find two other votes uh, to make a significant policy change. And fortunately, I, I'm in a city that leans so far left, we don't even know right. So <laughs> I'm the conservative on the council, and I'm the guy doing cannabis reform. That's how far left we go. So it's, a, it's an exception to the rule. It's a little, like, solid blue dot in the middle of Los Angeles County. But we get, because we are so solidly uh, left, we get to do a lot of progressive stuff. And so that's why we, uh, we passed our ordinance uh, last year. Got to move to WeHo. <laughs> so I, I'm going to disagree just slightly with both of you um, because I think uh, local government is is one of the rare opportunities where it is about every citizen, and there's much more of an opportunity to have your voice heard at the local government level than there might be at state government and. Often it really only takes a, a few voices to go and talk to your city council members, talk to your city managers, talk to talk to the folks at the police department, and resolve the issues as before they get started. Ideally, um, but that is the unique part of local government that I think is extremely important um, for for everybody in this industry. She, she stole my answer. <laughs> it's a cop out. You can't do that one. So it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting. You mentioned, obviously, the citizens. Um, a, lot of, a lot of California right now, like we heard on the other panels, uh, have bans everywhere. Um, 80 to 90 percent of California has a ban on cannabis. So given sort of the differences in who holds the power, is it the sheriff? Is it the, the city? You know, is it the mayor? Is it the people? Um, what is the biggest hurdle in finding out how to infiltrate these cities and these localities that have bans and get to the people who hold power when it differs from city to city? How, how do we effectively, in your own jurisdiction, know, oh, I am the one that holds the power, or no, I got to go to my sheriff because he or she holds the power? Uh, you know, that's a, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, I would say that for starters, and I'm curious to, to kind of get the actual statistics on, on what you're reporting as far as the number of jurisdictions that have, uh, that have ordinances prohibiting, you know, prohibiting any form of cannabis. Um, and maybe, maybe Canaregs over there can help out with that. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I think part of it starts with, with education. I mean, it's been mentioned before, but um, at least with respect to cities, I can't speak for, for counties necessarily, uh, but, but with cities, you know, there are, there are a lot of opportunities, as, as mentioned, um, with respect to going to, to council meetings and whatnot, uh, to try and just directly um, engage an office, a city council member office or, or whomever, um, as far as, you know, why, why you may think that or why you know that cannabis is good for, for, for someone's jurisdiction or, or why you believe the constituents of that jurisdiction you know, want cannabis where, you know, uh, when, when a council member or some other elected official, you know, might, might see otherwise or has, or has already put, you know, some sort of prohibition in place. So I, I think, you know, it, 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 starts with, it starts with council meetings first and foremost um, with respect to cities. But, but beyond that, I mean, you know, whether, whether it's a social media push, whether there's, whether there are, um, I mean, 
I know we have a lot of opportunities at the league to, uh, to have organizations come out and, and educate our members directly and, and interface with them directly in terms of you know, offering their services and, and, and what, it, what, what it is that they believe uh, you know, should take place uh, at, at our internal board meetings and whatnot. We, there are different opportunities to do that, but by and large, um, I think you know, it needs to start with, with the council meetings and with the, uh, with the staff at the city level um, as far as trying to, you know, trying to just get, get the word out or, or make your point known um, from where you stand. Uh, and, you know, perhaps this gentleman to my right can, can give some more poignant examples, but, uh, but I think that's where it starts. Um, it has to start with communication and you want to you wanna try to work with cities. Um, it's a lot easier to work with us than, than, to, than to fight us. Um, I'm learning that every day that I work at the league, so. If I can just add to that, I'd say, first of all, ab abandon logic, <laughs> right? Because logic doesn't work, but push common sense. And there's a distinction between logic and common sense. There are 32 states in the United States now that have some form of regulation of marijuana. The polling on medicinal marijuana nationwide is over 90%. It's over 90%. Like that debate is over. And, and I think for a lot of electeds who are worried about their next election, usually, if, if going in on the discussion on medicinal, there's not a person on a council who doesn't have a relative or somebody who has for, suffered from some form of cancer or, or some form of epilepsy or HIV or all these other debilitating illnesses that the medicine's in. It works, it, it works. There's no more debate around that. And, and, and getting in there to find out what the real objections are. Well, the real objections are driving under the influence. Great, don't let people smoke and drive, just like you don't let people drink and drive. Uh, let's use some common sense. And it's said in politics that rather than a spectrum of left to right, it's actually a circle. And, and the left and the right on this issue, I think, meet on the uh, policy per, uh, perception of uh, libertarianism. California has a very strong libertarian bent. Stay out of my life, leave me alone. People on the left or the right seek privacy, don't want anyone else intruding to my private decision making. That's a really strong political argument for both the left and the right. And I think that there's a common sense way to get to a lot of these issues from either perspective. Uh, and, and it just, I think, takes one heroic council member. I, I have friends on the Santa Ana Council. They're, they're kind of going through it right now. Uh, uh, and and there, are, there are suburban communities. It's just not gonna, you know, it's just not gonna happen. They're not gonna get there. But that's okay. The more business that comes to West Hollywood, I'm fine with it, you know? And at some point, they're gonna wake up and they're gonna say, what's happening in West Hollywood? They got a $100 million reserve. Yeah, well, no kidding, because we're doing common sense uh, policy over here. And if you get off your point of view and get to common sense, you, you'd see that this is really not what you fear it to be. I just want to say that the 80 to 90% statistic that was uh, dropped earlier by Max was a statistic from 2016. Um, and that was after uh, the League of Cities was on a roadshow uh, encouraging local jurisdictions to ban um, since they felt like there was a gun under their head, at, at their head, um, mandating them to regulate by March 1st. It was an erroneous deadline and a bill was uh, then introduced to rectify that. But we are at right now uh, about 35% of the state that either has regulations on the books or um, is moving towards creating sensible regulations. And I will just give an example of like how long this process takes. I've been in Yolo County for three years and um, I, and, Day one of me being on the ground and attending a board of supervisors meeting, I went right up to the opposition, which was a group of mothers um, who right away I could tell that uh, they didn't really care uh, about marijuana in general. They did believe that it was medicine, but there was guys with, with guns and dogs and they were living next door to them and they couldn't have their uh, Girl Scout meetings. And uh, it was, you know, solve this problem for me and I will go away. 
So I did something that I wouldn't recommend anyone else do, and I went and knocked on that grower's door and told him that the laws were about to change. We were passing an ordinance, and he was going to have to move. Um, that is not... I did suffer some consequences for that, so I would... <laughs> and I, did, tell me about that. I did have a friend that was beat with a baseball bat, in re, and uh, that was retaliation for that action. So um, I don't recommend that anybody does that. However, I never had those mothers come back to another meeting. Um, we have moved forward in that jurisdiction. Uh, we are awaiting the results of an EIR, and uh, we spent... As a community, the cannabis community spent about $75,000 on various uh, tax measure and uh, supporting uh, local elected officials that were pro-cannabis. Um, and uh, we still don't have an ordinance. We are awaiting the EIR. Hopefully in early uh, 2019, we will have a permanent ordinance in place, but that's been three long years of a lot of work. Um, and I always... This, and the strategy does not always work, but I always make a beeline up to the opposition immediately. I want to have a conversation. I want to know what their concerns are. I want to know if I can fix them and if they're actually reasonable, you know, uh, if there is a reasonable uh, solution to their concerns or if they are, you know, uh, evangelists and, um, you know, this is something that is a religious thing, then that, that, that's a whole nother thing. I actually really want to see a religious debate on this issue, but it's a whole nother topic. I want to see Bibles come out and I want them to decide once and for all, is Jesus pro-cannabis or not? I really want to see that. Because there are jurisdictions that that's what the issue is, you know? Um, but I really, I, I haven't always been successful in that strategy, but more often than not, I have... Um, been able to address concerns and um, seem like the reasonable one while, uh, you know, addressing them with the council members or the supervisors, whatever the jurisdiction is that I'm in. I think, Jackie, you make a great, great point about that, about going to the opposition and finding out what the opposition looks like and what their real concerns are, um, because often the, the initial concern presented is public safety. Well, that can mean a hundred different things and, and addressing that and being willing to listen to what those concerns are is a, is a helpful way to um, get regulations to progress. Um, in addition to that, I think that going into a jurisdiction that has a, a ban on commercial cannabis activity, the um, it's often a negative or a neutral. So looking at a group of advocates who want to um, who, who want to create a regulated cannabis market in a particular city or county. And then on the flip side is a negative of concerns about public safety or, or um, the children. Um, and there isn't necessarily, there aren't necessarily points made on the other side. So going in and saying not just it's a neutral or a negative because that makes it very easy to um, vote down a regulation, but on the flip side, looking at this is this is how much money is going to be brought into this city or county. This is what regulation is going to do. Earlier, someone said you cannot ban cannabis; you can only ban legal cannabis. Um, that is that is accurate. But saying, look, we're going to tr turn this public safety risk into a into a positive. Um, and also, we're going to create jobs in this community, and we're going to create jobs that require degrees. And we're, oh, by the way, we as this particular group are going to put money into early childhood education or uh, building a public pool or whatever that particular community is interested in. But in order to do that, you have to go into that community and find out what their what their particular needs are and listen to um, what those negatives are so that you end up tipping the scales and all of a sudden it's looking at all of this positive and how can the city council or board of supervisors vote that down because of all those positives and the negatives have been addressed. That's a great point, Ariana. I mean, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Real Charles. quick, um, both, because both Ariana and, and Mayor Duran uh, mentioned something. They they brought up really great points as far as as far as uh, common sense solutions, right? So with respect to cities, and and perhaps all of you know this already, but you know cities are scrambling for for revenue. Okay, and so when you talk about you know solutions that are going to bring revenue, bring tax revenues to cities, I mean they're looking at the past and they're saying like you know redevelopment gone, enterprise zones 
off the table. So cannabis is, you know, it, it, it certainly provides an opportunity to, to help build city coffers um, if done in a smart way. And so I think, you know, if there's, if there's a way to communicate that message and, and, and kind of lay out the how, um, there are going to be a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of jurisdictions who are already, you know, seeing their neighboring jurisdictions, you know, reap benefits, you know, at this point in time that are going to, going to want to come on board themselves. So just wanted to put that up. Yeah, so I'm hearing, obviously, common sense seems to be the way to go. Um, and thank you, Jackie, for being panelist and fact checker. Um, so we're not at 80 or 90 percent, we're at 65. Not great. But let's get maybe a more uh, apt example, um, you know, of sort of the neutral or negative. Um, and Charles, you're kind of pointing out, like, you know, we need the pros. We need why is this good? Why you know, is it revenue? Is it jobs? Um, so let's talk about, a, you know, something that happened very recently with the League of Cities. Um, and there was, uh, uh, you know, obviously you represent 482 municipalities. Um, there is this delivery uh, regulation in the proposed regs where delivery can, um, you can deliver to any jurisdiction regardless of whether it has a ban or not. Obviously very controversial. Um, what are some of the no's or the reasons why not or the reasons that are neutral or negative that the League of Cities is expressing? Genuinely, what, you know, obviously, we talk about common sense, the numbers are behind the cannabis movement. You know, what is the League of Cities so worried about with delivery in any jurisdiction, regardless of whether it's banned or not? Yeah, so um, first let me say that, you know, the, the League of California Cities, contrary to, to what some may think, I mean, so we're, we are neither pro nor anti-cannabis. That's, 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 that's never been the case. I mean, that's not the case, despite what some may think about the organization. With respect to delivery and, and what a lot of our cities see as, as the cons or the negatives, um, a lot of it does boil down to, to public safety, for starters. Um, as I understand it, there are, bear with me, I got you. So with respect to, with respect to public safety, and we talk about deliveries in, in particular, we're not, going, we're not talking about a retail establishment that has various security measures in place to, to you know, basically account for um, all of the cash on hand, not just the product, but the cash. And so when you lay out a scenario whereby you, know, you have a delivery vehicle um, going into whatever neighborhood, and you know, there are, uh, there's an opportunity or, or somebody, for whatever reason, however, peeps you know, that there is, that, that that delivery vehicle is you know, containing with cannabis, has cannabis. I mean, you put, our cities, there are cities who don't want to put their, um, they don't want to have to deal with the risk of, you know, putting their drivers at safe, uh, drivers at risk, um, delivery drivers, they don't want to put the, uh, uh, you know, they don't want to um, create situations whereby there are robberies, whereby there are, you know, any other crimes, ancillary to robberies where people can get hurt, since this is still an all-cash business. As I understand it, that is, that is one of the underlying concerns. With respect to the other proposed reg that, uh, that's still percolating uh, dynamic delivery, as, as it's called uh, colloquially, uh, where a delivery, a delivery driver can potentially carry up to $10,000 in cash, should that also, um, you know, pass or, or be adopted, uh, that's only going to, to uh, exacerbate the concerns that cities have. Beyond that, um, cities are concerned, you know, whether rational or not. They're concerned about, you know, delivery drivers going to the doors and you have potentially, let's say a 13-year-old answers the door, for instance. Oh yeah, this, this cannabis is for my grandmother. You know, I'll, I'll just take that. Now, granted, delivery drivers aren't supposed to, you know, hand that over necessarily, but Who's going to enforce that when you've got cash on the table necessarily? And, and that's, you know, I, I hear that beyond that, I hear that there is a, um, you know, there is, I, I should say the strongest argument yeah. beyond that, uh, the strongest argument against cities and, and their concerns, you know, that, that I've heard throw out there, thrown out there is that, you know, obviously there, there is a concern about patients. We have patient, patient access is, is key. 
I will say that they're, you know, people with cancer, persons that have mobility issues, patients should certainly have access to medicine. That is a conversation that I will, you know, say right now, I will be, will, I'm willing to engage anyone on and willing to go back to, you know, to my colleagues and say, hey, look, you know, we really need to discuss this issue. Every single proposal that we've seen on the table this year, as it relates to delivery, so it, 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 it from our vantage point, it shows that, uh, that patient access is not at the forefront of the delivery issue, okay? Now, and that are, in and of itself... Is the League of Cities, just specifically, are they worried about licensed delivery operators doing illegal activity? So, you know, obviously they've put on all the work and money into getting a license. Are they worried about those delivery operators, or are they worried about operators who do not want to do it legally? I think they're just concerned in general. There are some cities that are concerned just in general about how does that get enforced? And you know, how feasible it is, is it to enforce? We've got law enforcement telling, community, or telling our, our city officials that you know, we're not gonna be able to, to enforce you know, these delivery provisions and if stuff goes bad, stuff goes bad in our you know, community from a, licensed, uh, from a licensed operator from another community, that falls on us ultimately to handle. And so there are some cities like West Hollywood, like Pasadena, like others who are more than capable, who feel more than capable of handling delivery in their communities. And by all means, we want them to, to be able to have that, that, that option to, to, to offer that to, to operators. Do, do any there of the other, other panelists have any thoughts on delivery and sort of this idea that it can't be regulated, even though there's regulation in place and lots of money and licenses that delivery operators are going through to try to do it the right way? I, uh, I would like to, hello, okay. Um, the league is, yeah, well, and Charles, please don't take any of my comments personally. Um, I, I appreciate uh, you actually coming to the table today to have a discussion um, and hopefully we can uh, work together and open the league's mind and, and, and change this adversarial relationship that I do feel that we have. Um, I don't feel that the league is, is pro or anti-cannabis. I think that they are pro easy route, which is a ban, and anti the hard route, which is education on regulation. Um, and uh, the delivery issue is sort of bringing this adversarial relationship to a peak. Um, when the Stop the Wandering Weed campaign began, um, which was introduced by the UFCW, you guys signed on in support of it. Um, on Friday of last week, that campaign uh, came down off of their website, um, and we don't know why, um, but only after 86 of your members signed on in support of the Stop the Wan Wandering Weed campaign. The Stop the Wandering Weed campaign was a cartoon and we're not allowed to use cartoons because we would be marketing to children, but yet they used a, ca a cartoon to, uh, to rail us and showed us driving up to schools and, and dispensing uh, cannabis to children. And as if any licensed operator is gonna go through all of the local and state legal hurdles to get licensed to then vend to children was offensive. It was repulsive. It made my stomach turn. It still makes my stomach turn. And yet we have to turn the corner and figure out how we can, uh, you know, come to the table and figure out um, a compromise. And I keep hearing, oh, well, we wouldn't have had this issue if it was just about medical. Really? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, because it always goes back to local control. Oh, what about local control? Does, do local governments have control over uh, Norcos being delivered to a home? Do they have control over alcohol being delivered and making sure a child doesn't answer the door when that, when that package arrives? Seriously. Um, so why are they so about local control when it comes to cannabis? And, um, you know, the, the more that we regulate this, the less children are going to get access to it. And that is a reality. Um, the, but, and then to conflate the two issues of dynamic delivery and 5416D, um, they're two separate issues, yet we got smeared. Um, and, and there isn't another campaign to correct that, right? So let's say that maybe now the league regrets this decision to support that campaign but they're not going out to those 86 members and saying, hey, we screwed up. 
you know, um, the damage is already done. And it's, yeah, no, it's, it's seriously offensive. And um, I don't know how we're supposed to, right. And so my issue with the league has been, you can say you're, you're not anti or pro all you want, but you went out with like just uh, a, a campaign with a gun to the heads of the cities back in late 2015 and early 2016. And no one has gone out with that same energy to teach jurisdictions how to regulate. That's what we need. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. And so, we're going to do Q&A very shortly, so okay. feel free um, to... Well, let me just say that... Uh, let me just say that uh, with respect to, to the, the last issue you mentioned, yeah, we had that timeline. Cities had that timeline. Local governments had the timeline to put an ordinance in, on the books. Uh, and so, you know, before my time, but, you know, I understand that there may have been conversations that if communities did not want uh, cannabis, um, yes, to, to put an ordinance in place that prohibited cannabis in their communities, be, otherwise they would be preempted. And so, uh, as with anything, local governments or anyone doesn't like being told what to do. Um, and so, with Prop 64, as we know, there's divergent viewpoints on this, but yes, it was a patchwork of, in, in, in a sense whereby it allowed for locals to have or retain reasonable regulation authority. And so um, with respect to the wandering weed, the stop wandering weed, uh, I, I don't have a, a strong answer for you. I was out on paternity leave when that happened. I was probably the last person to find out about that. Um, I, I never actually saw the cartoon. Let the, let the panelists talk. I got you. I never actually saw the, the cartoon, um, but the, the point remains uh, it just goes to show how, how much cities are concerned um, that they would, that however many of them would sign on to it. Um, and I don't think you can separate out uh, 5416D and dynamic delivery because at the end of the day, if both are adopted, and I suspect both will be, um, you know, it is a public safety issue that cities are going to have to deal with. Local governments are going to have to deal with it who, who feel ill-equipped to be able to handle deliveries. And so, I mean, that's where I think the education, you know, is necessary. I'm not saying it's easy. If it was easy, everyone would do it. But that's what needs to take place if, in fact, you know, we're going to get to a place where we can have our local officials, you know, heed whatever it is that their constituents supposedly are, are saying to them. I mean, this is an election year, right? So if you want to, you know, talk to them, if you want them to listen to you, I mean, constituents have the power to do that. I mean, and Ariana, this guy's listening to his constituents. He's not going to get voted out. Did you have something to add, Ariana? So, With city understanding yeah, that they I can retain local design. regulation yeah. authority. Got it? Good. Okay. Uh, so... Are you, are you willing, is the league willing to engage in a conversation about real education for cities and counties and, um, and sitting down at the table with the cannabis industry? If, it's, if the league is not pro or anti, can we, can we have that conversation? I don't, I don't think it's too late. We still have 65% of jurisdictions to, to educate and to, to get regulations through, and I think... It's possible the league can be an ally in that rather than a uh, uh, hindrance. And last comment, and then we'll go to Q and A real quick, Charles. So, so I, I make no uh, make no commitment as to the result, but I'm open to having a conversation with anyone about you know how the league can you know help educate members, or how the league, at the very least, can facilitate education between industry representatives and local officials. I'm happy yep. to have that conversation. And I have a solution. Real quick, Jack. Really quick, I have we'll a solution. Get to this is what I would like to see the league do. I would like to see the league start with every jurisdiction, every one of their members that passed Proposition 64, beginning with a survey on what yes meant in their community. Okay, that is where we've gone wrong is we don't know what yes meant in every single jurisdiction. Does it mean that they want home deliveries? Does it mean they want retail locations? Does it mean they want commercial cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, all of that? Or did they just vote yes for social justice purposes? We need to figure that out in every community and then you regulate from there. Thank you, panelists. <laughs> Definitely.
a contentious topic, so I'm glad we went through that, but we're going to take it to the audience um, for Q&A. Emphasis on the Q, um, so make sure you have a question ready. Uh, first off, thank you to Susan for putting together this amazing event, and thank you to everyone on the panel for your insights. Uh, my question pertains to the sales tax on cannabis sales. Um, do you feel, it was stated earlier that a lot of the illicit shops are not paying any taxes on their uh, cannabis sales. Do you feel with it being a mainly cash industry that the licensed shops are paying their true amount of sales tax or do you feel that there may be some false reporting and tax evasion going on? Don't make me pick. Well, I, I, I just want to say, uh, first of all, in order to tax, it requires a vote of the people because of Proposition 218. So in the city of West Hollywood, we will probably have on the March 2019 ballot uh, a proposal sponsored by the council to ask the people to vote in a, in a tax. So taxes, city governments can't just impose a tax. You actually have to go to a vote of the people. And obviously, if the tax passes overwhelmingly, kind of tells you where the people are. The people are saying, we want this tax. Uh, it shows you that they're strongly in support. On issues of tax evasion, I think that anytime you're dealing with cash, and we have a lot of cash businesses in West Hollywood, we have a lot of bars and nightclubs that uh, they also deal heavily in cash every night. There's always the opportunity for tax evasion, but if they're smart, they don't want to get caught, they don't want to end up like Jimmy Hoffa uh, sitting in a federal prison. So. Uh, you know, I, I think we just have to trust that people are going to comply, ultimately. Sorry, the mic. Um, I, I can't speak specifically to what any individual business is doing in terms of tax evasion. I can tell you that our clients that we're working with so hard to get licensed and that that process takes can take a year or two years or three years if regulations aren't yet on the books. Um, they are, are constantly asking questions about how, what taxes they owe, how the best way to pay their taxes is. My advice is always to go and talk to an accountant because I am not an accountant. Um, but they are looking to be responsible in paying their taxes because they work that hard to get their license. They don't want to then turn around and lose it because they didn't pay their taxes. Yeah. I think a big issue is how high the taxes are. Right. I mean, they're not the same taxes that you have for other industries in the same city. San Francisco, they don't have a tax now, but they want to go one to seven percent. So, you know, there obviously can be always be evasion, but you know, the taxes are breaking people. All right. She warned me not to pick on you, Charles. Oh, my my name's Dale Schaefer. I'm working with Jackie, and I want to at least start the, the question as sort of a dialogue inside of the League of Cities. Do you have a discussion group that understands that every nook and cranny of the state is having deliveries happen right now with large amount of products and large amount of cash? Do you understand this industry is up and running and we are trying to, to work with you and other power brokers to try to bring this regulated? that right now you are the enemy and we don't want you to be. So we're trying to reach out to you like Jackie did at a group. You're the person we've got to try to please, but you're the people holding keys that are taking us out regularly. And does your organization want to work with us? So yeah, thank you for your, for your question. Um, so uh, first and foremost, I don't think that anyone is ignorant to, to the fact that there is an illicit market out there, right? And uh, you know, all kinds of operators um, are, are acting illegally. And yes, that is, a, that is an issue um, that, that, that legalized operators, you know, they're, gonna, they're, they're fighting, they're trying to contend with. As far as the league goes, um, you know, I, I came into this panel expecting to be recognized as the bad guy. Um, you know, I want to find ways or, you know, at least, yeah, I want to find ways to, to work with, with industry. Um, I mean, it, 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 starts with, it starts with conversations and, and, and civility there. Uh, obviously, there, are, there is a lot of, again, there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of, of uh, I should say, hurt feelings based on whatever may have transpired uh, in the past, both leading up to and, and since the, uh, the passing of, of, since the passing of Prop 64. And so, 
Um, I mean, I'm, I can only speak for myself in terms of what, what I'm willing to do. I, I'm, I'm certainly willing to have a conversation with you, further conversation with Jackie and or whomever else wants to, um, to see what sort of bridges can be built. And, and we can just hopefully go from there. Great. Can I jump in on that question? Absolutely. So I've been a member of the California League of Cities for 18 years and the National League of Cities. And I just want to say that this is not intended. I feel like Switzerland between the two, <laughs> two panelists here. But, but what, I, what I will say is the California League of Cities exerts a great deal of influence in Sacramento on legislation. They do not exert a great deal of influence on local government. We are members of local government. And what happens a lot of time is the people who are really actively involved in the California League of Cities come from small conservative towns around the state. And the big city council members don't participate. It's very rare for me to see a San Francisco supervisor or a Los Angeles City Council member at a League of Cities event. They just don't participate. So what Charles is saying is correct. They are supposed to be neutral. I, I would suggest that you all, uh, this woman here, right, she's going to get my card, I know, come to the city of West Hollywood, Santa Cruz, Berkeley, San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles, and encourage us to ask the League of Cities, because we're all members, to let us sponsor a panel on reasonable regulation at the annual conference of the League of Cities. You see? Yeah. We're going to hold you to that, Mayor. I'll organize it for you. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That, and then we'll have a panel on what Jesus smokes, right, Jackie? <laughs> Burning bush. Gave it away. All right. One more. Let's do one more. Okay, last question. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Chicas. I'm a director of government affairs for Cannabis Advising Partners. Uh, my question was really relating to equity and transparency in the decision making for these applications. Because what we're finding is that as time goes on, more and more of these decisions regarding licensing across the board are becoming more and more political, uh, more and more personal interest and competing interest and conflicts of interest are going into those decisions. So how do we work together to improve equity and transparency in the decisions that are being made at the local government level so that the best applicants can really be the best uh, or can have uh, uh, their foot in the door rather than the person with the most contacts or the most contributions toward a political campaign. Can I jump in on this Thank one? Thank you for too? that question. Yes, please. So when we looked at this very carefully because we did not like the first come, first serve method, and we didn't like the lottery, as we you know didn't want either of those. So we instead developed a merit-based system. And I got to tell you, when we were first starting to discuss this, all of a sudden, every pet cause that I am part of was suddenly seeing a great influx of cannabis dollars going into all of my pet causes because that is the way that you know politics works. So we were cognizant from the beginning that there was going to be an attempt to try to curry favors from the electeds on our council. So we developed a merit-based system where the applications, that we have 300 applications that have come in, are being reviewed by a seven-member committee, none of whom have any interest or business interest. In fact, I only know one of the names because somebody accidentally told me that this person was on the committee. But the five council members, we have no idea who even the seven committee people are. They're reviewing the applications. They're going through it on various criteria. I wrote them down, innovative business model, connection to West Hollywood, business operations, social equity, product offerings, design concept, security plan, and experience in the industry. Those are the criteria. I came up with a point system. And these seven women and men are going to go through all 300 applications, and they're going to make recommendations to the Business License Commission, who then gives them one of the, what I call the golden tickets, for, you know, Willy Wonka reference, one of the golden tickets to then go out out and find a location somewhere in the city. And then only if all of that, if people are unhappy, they think something went awry, is it appealable to the council. So we have intentionally tried to keep ourselves away from the decision making to the greatest extent possible. Ultimately, we have to have some concern because it's we're the electeds, so we have to, you know, we, we're responsible for everything. But we really try to create a system where we're out of the evaluation to avoid the appearance that the, these golden tickets were for sale in any which way. So that's a system we've come up with. I think it's unique uh, at this point. Uh, we're still in the middle of the process, and we expect that those uh, licenses will be handed out at the end of October or early November, and then 
will be in the process. So I, I'm hoping that what we've come up here as a model ordinance that other cities will replicate it as a way to make decision based on merit rather than just happenstance or first come, first serve. And just a quick follow up, Mayor, specifically because the gentleman asked about social equity, is there anything in place to be assured that these will be sustainable uh, models? I'm assuming in the applications they'll have all the criteria you said, including social equity. Is there any report that will be given out quarterly or yearly? Is there anything holding these businesses accountable to the, the criteria that they applied with to make sure that they continue that in the future? Yeah, yes, and it'll be like a lot of the other adult businesses in my community. I have a lot of adult businesses. I have a lot of bars, adult bookstores. I have a lot of businesses that you know are people consider not worthy of business. I got them all. I'm, we're happy to have them. Bookstores, and, gotcha. and the way that uh, we regulate that is uh, using our code enforcement. But uh, there's a commission, a business license commission, who has oversight. We did not want to grant any permits that ran with the land, meaning we didn't want to give something that ran with the land, but rather goes with the operation. And that's why it's a business license rather than a permit. There's a, a distinction. In terms, the lawyer over here will tell you. There's a distinction in terms of what it is that we're giving and how quickly we can take it away yeah. if there's yeah. a violation. Thank you. Um, well, that wraps it up. This is an incredible panel. Thank you again. Round of applause for all the panelists. Kyle, John, Ariana, and Jackie, thank you.